Welcome to Avi Network's Takeoff Tuesday's webinar. Today's topic is Perfect Forward Secrecy for iOS 9. The presenter is Nathan McMahon. So Nathan, tell our listeners what's new in iOS 9? What has Apple introduced that is an important consideration for um, application developers and also the d deployments of these applications? And in addition to all the usual functions and features that every new version has, one of the subtle little changes in there is that Apple has changed up their requirements for SSL. So we're going to spend a little bit of time going over that. And SSL, for the most part, is viewed as fairly static. I either have SSL on for my site or I don't. But the reality is SSL is very, very far from static. SSL versions are changing uh, very continuously as uh, new versions are ratified and adopted. So we've moved from SSL now to TLS, although it's the industry still refers to it as SSL. SSL is pretty much deprecated now and should not be used in any of the versions of uh, version 2, version 3, etc. Um, we're now up to the most latest version is uh, TLS 1.2 and we're looking at 1.3 even being just around the corner. We're seeing as well in the certificate space, uh, RSA is now uh, slowly losing favor and, uh, and, and instead now people are migrating towards elliptic curve cryptography or certificates that are based upon elliptic curves. And we're seeing also this last bullet, which is that instead of a single time, uh, single key that's reused for every session, we're moving towards perfect forward secrecy. So there's been a lot of these uh, technical advances in SSL, but for the most part, most of these advances have not really adopted or been filtered down into the, uh, the typical uh, sites that you go and hit on the internet. So what's happened lately is that with the latest version of iOS 9 that came out, uh, Apple has uh, officially declared that SSL is not good enough. You need to really update uh, uh, your SSL settings and be able to support modern security. And this is something that Google and a few others have been pushing for quite some time with limited success. But um, Apple has taken this a significant step further in what they're mandating. So they're saying now that um, if you write any applications that are going to uh, be iOS 9, uh, built for iOS 9, under the hood, these applications are going to be making API calls. These API calls must be, uh, it must be secure, and they must be um, using very specific uh, SSL settings. So there's, uh, it's not to say that you, you exclusively must be using these exact versions of SSL with PFS, but this is saying they've got a very specific list. And uh, if you take a look at the website that I've got linked below, you'll see under the developer.apple.com, uh, they, they call out a specifically which APIs, etc., and uh, the requirements. But suffice to say, it really boils down to this: if you're going to be able to, if you're going to have any applications that need to support iOS, iOS 9, and even the Mac OS um, latest versions, you need to be adopting modern SSL security. And the reality is, it shouldn't take someone like Apple to push the internet into doing this. This is something that should have happened long, long ago. This technology has been around for quite some time. There's no reason to have stalled. A lot of the reasons or excuses for having not adopted these has really fallen by the wayside over the years. So you can read some of the bullet points of this list, and this list is directly from Apple, and it's saying that you need to support TLS version 1.2. In other words, uh, you have to be using the latest version of SSL TLS. You cannot be using SSL v3. They've just done away with SS TLS even 1.0 and 1.1. You must be using ciphers that use forward secrecy. Forward secrecy, perfect forward secrecy, effectively the same thing. Uh, and that is the, the really important point there is that they have a very specific list of ciphers and these ciphers uh, enable forward secrecy to happen. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and then you also have to be using a more updated uh, certificate with SHA-256 rather than SHA-1. Um, and so right now, that's pretty much about 99% of the uh, clients on the internet support this. So that does mean that there is a small subsection of the internet that is not going to support the SHA-256, for instance, or may not support things like TLS 1.2. And basically, Apple's saying, enough is enough. We've been dragging our feet. The internet has been dragging its feet for a very, very long time, for many years. We simply need to start adopting newer technologies. People need to become a lot more current. Um, and so a couple other things that you need to support, obviously, a more modern SSL certificate, uh, both RSA or, preferably, elliptic curve. You can take a look at the link below, and it'll also give you a couple of other examples. There is, uh, Apple does allow for exceptions, where if you don't think that you're able to adopt modern SSL security, you can put together an XML file that explains why you're not able to be secure and why your applications are not secure. Obviously, that's not something that too many people will want to do. That's not something you want to brag about is, here's why I 
choose to not make my apps be secure and, and then send this out to any clients connecting from a Mac or from a, a, an iOS enabled device. So Apple really, they have the clout to push this forward and that's something that has really changed uh, the way that a lot of people view SSL and it's about time. So to kind of go over the, the points about uh, this session, we're talking about PFS specifically. And the reason why I'm picking on PFS is that PFS has a dirty little secret, and that is it has some very important um, impacts on the way that load balancing and application delivery and just serving SSL works. So with SSL today, you've got your certificate, and with that cert, you have the, uh, the private key. You use that private key whenever a client comes in, and you secure that connection for that client with that private key life is good, everything is secure and encrypted. The problem with this is that if someone does record that session of one of these or all of these users, later on, let's say a year later, they get a hold of that private key, they can then go back after the fact and decrypt that session. They can decrypt all your sessions because they have the private key. So this has happened both in terms of when people do something like they RMA their hardware load balancer or server, it has the keys on it and somebody gets a hold of that. That's happened a number of times. This can happen because someone is able to hack in and steal the key. This can happen because, the let's say, the U.S. government gets a warrant to uh, grab your keys and you have to give up the keys in the process. They can now go and decrypt any sessions or email or anything that's happened over your site. Perfect Forward Secrecy changes this a bit. You have a, your certificate and its uh, corresponding private key, but with this private key, rather than using this private key to encrypt end users' connections, what you do is you use this key to generate what's called a one-time ephemeral key. This one-time key is used then to encrypt the connection. So for that user that's coming in, the blue user, we generate a key for them, we use that to encrypt their, their session, and then we throw away that key. That ephemeral key is thrown away, which means that if you steal that original master key, that's great, it's useless. It, you cannot use that to decrypt after the fact these other sessions because you need to have that ephemeral key, which was already disposed of. So it eliminates the ability in that very, very large hole in SSL to be able to go back after the fact and decrypt. And we've seen this a number of times, most uh, prominently with things like the Eric Snowden uh, uh, issues. So that's great. Life is good. All you have to do is turn on perfect port secrecy. How do you do that? To do that's not terribly difficult. You simply need to have a system that supports PFS, and you need to take advantage of the PFS-enabled ciphers. Uh, which will have uh, any cipher that ends with an E. So it'd be like E-C-D-H-E. So you'll see that E at the end there, meaning ephemeral. Um, the problem with this is that uh, all hardware load balancers out there that people are using today prim primarily for SSL offload, they do SSL offload in ASICs, these little, or FPGAs more specifically, Cavium, et cetera. And everyone uses the same ASICs, every hardware load balancer, they're using the same things. And these ASICs have not been updated in many, many years. And the problem with that is that since they haven't been updated, they don't support modern SSL. For instance, they do not do perfect port secrecy. That's a bit of a problem. So what happens then is that if you turn on or try to use perfect port secrecy, uh, for most vendors, it's fine, it'll work. However, what's going to happen is that the hardware load balancers are not doing this in the ASICs. They are doing this in software on a CPU. So what's the impact of that? Well, uh, a, uh, a large competitor in, in the uh, load balancing space that has a legacy hardware load balancer and their top of the line uh, appliance form factor, their 10,200B SSL, they advertise it'll do 75,000 SSL transactions per second. But if you just simply go and do that 75,000 TPS and then you say, oh, I want to turn on PFS, that will drop down to 2,400 transactions per second and completely saturate your CPU. So that will pretty much devastate the performance of your system. Um, so just saying, hey, Apple wants us to update our SSL, sure, let's go ahead and do that. There is a minor, mm, call it about a 30x uh, degradation in performance. That might be important to know. Uh, on their website, um, you know, said competitor says that you might see a slight hit uh, to the CPUs. I would call that more than a slight hit when you are looking at 30 times the impact. Um, now, the important thing to know as well is that this is with RSA. If you're using elliptic curve, elliptic curve definitely gets better performance. Um, for specifically for PFS, but just in general, it's better performance than RSA, which is why the industry is really starting to look at, hey, we need to migrate from RSA to elliptic curve. Some vendors support EC, EC some do not. The problem there is that some clients support EC, some do not. So you have to be cognizant that if you do want to migrate and say, let's go and use elliptic curve, 
uh, someone using, let's say, your BlackBerry 1 or someone that's using IE6 will not negotiate elliptic curve. So you may be stuck with RSA or you may be okay with using elliptic curve. Now, the interesting thing with Avi is that you can support elliptic curve and RSA for the same application at the same time. And we'll pref we, we will prioritize using elliptic curve if the client supports it. If the client doesn't support it, that's okay. We'll use RSA. So there's no loss in performance and there's no loss in client compatibility either, which is very, very crucial. So if the answer then is that uh, you're not able to use perfect forward secrecy in hardware on these dedicated ASICs anymore, you have to do it in CPU, great, that's fine. Then the answer is pretty simple. All I need to do is add more CPU. The problem with that is that if you've got a legacy hardware load balancer, under the hood they're using an Intel CPU. Great. Uh, however, they're charging you prices for their proprietary vanity hardware. Uh, regardless of what the actual CPU costs. That's a bit of a problem. So if you're using something like a, a CPU, CPU cores, great if I, I can do 2000 TPS for elliptic curve per core, so I just need more cores to get to whatever number it is I need to sustain. I want 100,000 SSL TPS. I need around 50 or so cores. Keep in mind that these numbers here are rough numbers, uh, meaning that you could have a, an Intel Xeon V2 or versus a V3. You could have a um, 2 gigahertz processor versus a 3 gigahertz processor. These numbers here are pretty much middle of the road. You can actually get much better numbers than these if you're running more current hardware than I have in my particular lab. But um, so what this, the problem with this is that if CPU is the issue and all you have to do is add more CPU, the problem with the hardware appliance is that it's this dedicated massive box that sits in your network and it's pretty much finite in what capacity it can handle. Avi's approach is very different, where we've done a couple of things. We've separated the control plane from the data plane, so we're not wasting our CPU on the GUI or on doing basic control plane health monitoring, these kinds of tasks. Instead, we've separated this out, and we've instead put the load balancer into its own dedicated data plane, and then we have a dedicated controller. So we take that load balancer, that data plane, we distribute it onto software uh, on whatever CPU cycles you have available in your infrastructure. So we can run on any generic Intel CPU doesn't matter. And if you need more capacity because we have more clients that come in, not a problem. We simply go and fire up a couple more micro load balancers. And you can have one load balancer, you can have a hundred. It doesn't really matter. You're just managing one system. Think of this as a fabric. Instead of having a, a, an active standby pair, uh, and if one of them one of the devices fails, you're in a lot of you're in a world of hurt. In this case, I've got a hundred micro load balancers. If one of them fails, I have 99. My capacity uh, is down by 1%, and 30 seconds later it'll self-heal and it'll be right back to where it was. If I need to double my capacity, that's okay. I just increase the number of CPUs I'm consuming, either by uh, having a single micro load balancer consume more CPUs itself, or I can scale out across multiple micro load balancers to consume more. So we do this via our elastic scaling capability, which I highly encourage you to take a look at some of our uh, webinars and other documentation on how this works. But the point is, you can, on the fly, Simply pick up more CPU when you need more capacity. So taking a look at what this provides you, um, and just not even just an Avi versus a proprietary hardware, this is just this is SDN, which is I can use generic x86 CPUs. I can elastically scale anytime I need. It's very easy to be current and to be modern. And you look at the proprietary hardware, you're running on ASICs, and these ASICs get revved every five years, so you're are you at the beginning or tail end of that cycle? You have very little control. In fact, even your vendor has very little control over this. So it's something where this is why the industry is moving away from proprietary hardware is for all of these reasons. This is why SDN is really taking off. Uh, and this is very much the architecture that Avi has leveraged. And you'll see this is the same architecture that's used by the Googles, Facebooks, etc. of the world for this very same reason. They can do things like scale out SSL. They can support perfect forward secrecy, and it works very well. So to kind of give you an idea of what this looks like, uh, Avi versus, in this case, the high-end SSL load balancing platform from uh, one of our, our largest competitor. Uh, if you look at the numbers, if we're using a couple of, let's say, uh, uh, we just let's say we use a couple of uh, Intel uh, CPU, let's say Dell boxes, uh, we can with uh, with two boxes there, we can do 100,000 SSL TPS, and it costs you about 50 grand for the hardware plus the Avi software. If you look at a competitor, you're looking at about 12,000 SSL TPS for $200,000. It's about a 30x difference, which is kind of impressive. Um, in fact, even uh, beyond that, we did a couple of tests on just running Avi on a laptop, and my laptop can outperform the high-end uh, competitor SSL device. 
So, and that says something. That's when you know that the market is so completely out of whack when a laptop can outperform your load balancer. So a couple of things that Avi is doing, in fact, is that uh, we're, we're very confident in, in, in this to the point uh, that SSL really is, is migrating to, uh, to software. Yeah, you can hear some interesting quotes from uh, various folks at Google and other places uh, that are very prominent in the industry, and they just say it's, it's time to really update the SSL security, and it's time to move this into software so that you can take advantage of the latest security. So one of the things Avi is providing is that you can actually take Avi, download it, and within half an hour, you can have this sitting in front of your existing load balancer. Let it do its, its whatever it's doing. If it's running its various uh, load balancing, it's scripting, it's this, it's that. But simply have uh, Avi do the, uh, the SSL offload. And we can offload this. Uh, we, uh, we'll provide offload for two applications. Uh, no cost, no time limit, no nothing. You can just download this, and our, our trial version uh, doesn't expire. And you can, uh, with a, just with the, the download trial version, It'll offload the SSL with PFS with whatever capacity you require for your existing hardware load balancer. So if you find that your hardware load balancer is running out of juice, you can take advantage of Avi, and at no cost you can take you can take advantage of this. And the reason why we're doing this is, first off, uh, you shouldn't have to be paying for things like SSL anymore. SSL has has been used for a very long time now as a means to get customers to pay more money for more expensive hardware that they don't necessarily need. Uh, those days are pretty much over. Um, but we're very confident as well that once you take advantage of this, you're going to find that some of the other uh, capabilities that Avi has is just head and shoulders above the competition. If you look at things like your SSL certificate management, if, you, if you're looking at this, uh, the, the lower half there, the legacy cipher management, going and modifying SSL ciphers is remarkably painful. That's not the sort of thing you want to do. And yet this is what Apple's saying you need to do. You need to go through this list and you've got to go and define the specific ciphers and order the ciphers correctly. That, will, that way you will be able to uh, support what they're requiring for iOS 9. With Avi, it's point, click, drag, drop. And as you're doing this, you'll see that there's an SSL rating that'll tell you what your security score is, what your performance score is. So it's telling you real time as you're making changes uh, how you're doing, if that looks right, if that doesn't. It, in other words, it's so much easier to use. Uh, a lot of visibility as well is going to show you uh, what the breakdown is of clients that are coming in. So you can even inspect down to any specific client. You can understand who, what they negotiated, which client browsers are negotiating with which versions. So you can slice, dice, drill this any way you want. It doesn't require any custom scripting, anything out of the box. It's just, it just works. Uh, and so we're very confident in that about Avi is that ultimately we're going to provide you elastic scalability of SSL. We're going to provide you the most modern, most current SSL capabilities. And we're going to provide you this in a, in a form factor that's easy to consume. And you have complete and total control over what you want this to do. So take a look at this. Download Avi uh, uh, off of the www.avinetworks.com website. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and ask us anything about this. And we appreciate your time. Thanks, Nathan. Um, appreciate it. If there are any questions, yes, there is one question, Nathan, here on, on, on the GoToWebinar, which is um, you mentioned, do you need any special kind of server or CPU for this SSL offload? If I download your software from the website, can I just put it on any server and any spec requirements? So there's no spec requirements. Obviously, bigger, better CPUs is preferable, but not a requirement whatsoever. So uh, there are the later versions of, uh, of Intel and AMD CPUs continue to advance something called AESNI, which helps with the performance, particularly with what's called the bulk encryption. But for the new handshakes or the, the handshakes per second TPS, that really doesn't directly make much of an impact. So no, just any CPU will work, though preferably we would prefer uh, Xeon V3, two point something gigahertz or faster. Got it. Yeah, one more question, Nathan, which is with Avi in front of the load balancer, how is the data encrypted from Avi back to the application servers behind the load balancer? Is it with TLS without PFS or? Do you have any recommendations on that? That's completely up to you, as So clients to Avi need to support the specific level of SSL from Apple. Um, but from Avi to the backend server, there is, uh, they're not specifying what that needs to look like. So it could be TLS, it could be unencrypted, any option that you choose. Correct. Work. And generally what you'll find is that it's a much cheaper operation because some of the things you can do to the backend server is you can open up an SSL session or socket over that socket, you can push multiple customers. So you don't need to have a new handshake per second for every, or new handshake for every single client. Mm -hmm. You can open up an SSL tunnel and then push existing customers through that, and, right. and new customers through that tunnel. 
That's only on the back side between Avi and the server. From the client to Avi, you're still going to take advantage of everything, but you can have a lowered security posture while still keeping it SSL end to end. Got it. <clears throat> thank you. I think those were the only questions. So thank you very much everyone for joining and thanks Nathan. Uh, again, if you have any questions, you can reach out to Nathan at nathan at avinetworks.com. And if otherwise, uh, hope you download Avi software and um, um, play with it. Thank you.